I would like to call to order this meeting of the Monroe County Board of Commissioners. For the record, I will note that Commissioner Thomas is not present, but both uh, Commissioner Jones and I are. So we'll start with the public statement. Um, we, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, renew our commitment to welcome and protect the rights of all people, regardless of age, race, color, creed, disability, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, marital status, economic status, and national origin. And we affirm the right of every person to live peacefully and without fear, and we will fight and resist at every step discrimination and harmful policies, whatever their source. We also stand in support of our county public school systems, both RBB and MCCSC. I believe now we're ready for department updates. Let's start with Ms. Cottle. Good morning. This week, we will remain in a red advisory and in Indiana, in the two score metric, all counties are in red at this time. Our cases per 100,000 are expected to be about 1,450 and our positivity rate will be about 20%. Now that's just a slight increase from last week, but so it's not dramatic as it had been in the previous week, but it is still concerning. And before we get too excited, let's keep a little bit of perspective. While this could be a good sign that things might be stabilizing a little bit, it also may be a result of delayed results coming in uh, testing difficulties. We know that demand is extremely high. Testing facilities are, you know, really being overwhelmed. Results are taking much longer to come in. Um, home tests are difficult to get, um, and those are not reportable. So there are a variety of things that could be driving those numbers as well. So we will continue to watch those. Um, we know that with home tests and people just not testing, maybe assuming that other family members have tested positive and now they're sick, that they um, are infected. And that's probably a, a good guess. Uh, but those things will change and alter some of the numbers so that we know that reported cases are always a little bit less than actual infection, right? Because not everything will get reported. So we will continue to watch the data and not just here, but across the state and the nation to get a better picture of what's happening. And time will really tell us what, what the outcome is. Omicron is by far the primary variant being seen in Indiana. Breakthrough infections and reinfections are more common with Omicron, while still a very small percentage of infections among fully vaccinated and up-to-date individuals. On a good note, the federal government did launch the free at-home tests via email. That actually launched yesterday. It was kind of a soft launch. Today was the official day. It's covidtests.gov. If you need to order your tests, you can get four per address at this time. And they may take seven to 12 days to be delivered. So this is something for you to order and have on hand for future need. It's not going to to address the need you may have today or tomorrow or even next week. Private insurance companies now must cover the cost of home tests as well. So if you are purchasing those, if you find them in a pharmacy, a drugstore, and you make that purchase, you can file a claim to be reimbursed with your insurance company if you have health insurance. There is a limit on the number of those per month. I think that it is eight per month. Um, but just know that there is a limit to those. Masks are still important and everybody is encouraged to wear their masks properly to upgrade your mask if possible. The CDC has updated their webpage to address this uh, kind of going over different types of masks, but wear the best mask that you have available. If you are wearing a cloth mask, um, and we talked about this for a long time, multiple layers is, is what you want. Some cloth masks have a pocket for a filter that will help make them more protective, wash them frequently, 
And so none of this is really new information. It is just that with the increased transmissibility of Omicron, uh, the, the best mask you can have is even more important than it's been in the past. But well-fitting, worn well um, is key to, to this, regardless of the type of mask that you have. Uh, our nurses are finishing up their school uh, second dose clinics this week, and those have been going well. I think they were in a school yesterday and did about 77 um, vaccines, um, so those second doses. So we were pleased about that. We also have a school booster clinic scheduled for the 29th, and we will. that's kind of like those super shot clinics that we did before, and this will be for those students who are now eligible for their booster. And we will continue to assess the need and the demand for those types of clinics, and we will schedule more of those as necessary. Uh, we did receive confirmation yesterday that our request for another mobile clinic has been approved. So we are anticipating getting details about that. That should come next week, probably Wednesday through Saturday. And as soon as we have all of those details, uh, we will share those first probably on social media. So follow us on Facebook. You'll get that information very, very quickly. Indianapolis Motor Speedway was extended through February 26th, and they've changed some of their hours. So Tuesday and Thursdays, they are open noon to 8 p.m., and Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday are 8 to 4 p.m. Again, I mentioned this earlier with testing demand being very high. Turnaround times can be long for PCR tests. Rapid tests are in short, 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 excuse me, short supply. Whether you're going to a test site or at home kits, I think that I mentioned last week that the Indiana Department of Health is out of rapid tests. So what they have distributed is what's available at sites. And once those are gone, they're gone. They do not have a, a, an expected date. Uh, they have ordered more tests. They're doing everything they can to get more rapid tests. Uh, but they do not have an anticipated date to have more at this time. So if you have symptoms, test if you are able, stay home, isolate from others to reduce transmission. And while the CDC has reduced time at home in isolation, the full isolation period is still 10 days. The difference is that you can actually leave your home after five days if your symptoms are improving, you've not had a fever for 24 hours, and you wear a mask when you are around others, a well-fitting mask, a good mask indoors or out for the full 10 days. So you still have that mask wearing for those additional five days um, on day six through 10, if you come out of your home, out of isolation in that respect, on after day five. Quarantine is very similar to that. So you can look at the, that information on the CDC's website. But I also want to talk about where this can get very confused, confusing. Members, remember that your workplace, your school, another business may choose to not go to that less restrictive time frame right away. Uh, so many are concerned about doing that during this surge, and so they are kind of holding back and kind of waiting to move to that uh, shorter time frame um, a little bit later when numbers are improving. So you may encounter that. You might encounter that with your workplace or where your children go to school. Um, just be mindful of those differences. Uh, the FSSA just released revised guidance for early uh, childhood education, pre-K, and the key component there is vaccination and masking ability. So we have just sent those out to our facilities so that they will have that information as well. And lastly, I just want to say a big thank you to all who are being patient and kind dur during this surge. Thank you. Mr. Jones, do you have any comments or questions? Yes, and earlier this week, I saw someplace that more people under the age of 30 are dying of 
COVID than those who are over the age of 80, um, which is a disturbing thing to see. I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that the older people are being better about getting vaccinated. But this is something for parents and younger people to be aware of. And, and the vaccines truly do matter for young people. They should be getting them. They certainly do matter. And while we've seen uh, more breakthrough and reinfections, the number is still small in comparison. Infections tend to be um, much milder in those who are fully vaccinated, especially if they've had their booster. Um, that isn't to say there won't be people with severe illness uh, who've received their booster, but it's far less likely to happen. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think it's important to point out too that reinfections do occur. There are folks out there who believe that once they've had COVID that they're fully protected and that's just not what we're seeing, correct? That is correct. Um, the term, we, sometimes we hear the term natural immunity and that always gives me pause because I think that people are thinking that they've had COVID before and they're good to go. They're, um, is only in when you're talking about sort of that quarantine, uh, if you've been infected, it's 90 days, it, you know, so, and that doesn't mean that you can't get reinfected in that 90 days, that has happened, um, but we, we do need to be very, very cautious. And um, you did mention a school booster clinic for January 29th, where would that be? That is, I believe it is again at uh, Bloomington High School South Cafeteria. It's really nice that MCCSC is working with us this way. Yes. And again, we will assess kind of the demand and the need um, and use that kind of as our guide uh, to scheduling additional uh, clinics. So remember when we did the other super shot, we were at RBB one day, we were at MCC one day, and so we'll be assessing those. We found that as convenient as the in-school clinics are with the two doses and then the booster, doing these larger clinics, just targeting school um, students um, and maybe faculty or staff um, seem to be a better way for us to get larger numbers at one time. Great planning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all your staff for making a big difference. Are there any other departments that um, have anything they want to share with us today? Any updates? Seeing none, um, let's move on to public comment. I uh, will remind people that this is for items that are, <clears throat> excuse me, not on our agenda, you're limited to three minutes per speaker. And at two minutes and, <clears throat> excuse me, 30 seconds, you will hear a sound. Do we have that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so at this time, if there are any um, attendees that wish to speak, please raise your hand and state your name and whether or not you are Monroe County uh, resident. I am not seeing anyone um, shows an interest in speaking today. So um, Commissioner Jones, shall we move on to item five? Move approval of the minutes for January 12th, 2022. I'll second that. Do you have any comments or corrections? No, I don't. I didn't either, it felt really good. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Cockrell, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Motion is approved, two to zero. Great, okay. Um, go to item number six. Move approval of the claims docket, accounts payable January 19th, 2022. Second, Mr. Miller. Good morning, commissioners. 
the total for claims was $1,225,531.83. $258,007 was for Area 10 Agency on Aging Rural Transit for the FTA or Federal Transit Administration Operating Grant for quarter ending 630 of 21. $245,341.79 was for October wheel and surtax distribution. And finally, $127,578.58 was for RBB CSC uh, Richland Bean Blossom Community School Corporation for STEAM Fall 2021 per the RDC agreement. Would you explain to people what the STEAM agreement is? Uh, yeah, I had a feeling you were going to ask me that. And, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it stands for science, technology, uh, something along those lines. And I, of course, it, engineering, I think it's engineering, arts and math. Yes, thank you. My apologies for, for being prepared for that acronym, as well as uh, didn't have RDC either. Redevelopment Commission? Redevelopment. And if you want a little background on that, that uh, program, I, I'm more than happy to share it. As you know, I staff the Redevelopment Commission. Um, you know, state code allows for the Redevelopment Commission to enter an agreement with someone who's developing uh, the workforce to give a up to a certain percentage of the revenue towards that programming. Um, the Redevelopment Commission started this uh, project with the Richland Bean Blossom Community School Corporation because that is the school corporation that's in that covers the West Side uh, TIF, which is our revenue generating TIF district. Um, started that probably five, six years ago that we actually renewed that contract last year to help them uh, do additional um, uh, staff training and, and additional programming. Uh, I would invite the public if they wanna know more about it. I think at the February Redevelopment Commission we'll get our semi-annual report from the Richland Bean Blossom School Corporation to see what they're doing and, and how they're utilizing that money. But the history of it has been very exciting and has done a lot of, of good things for that school. Yeah, and it, I also did have, it, it goes to fund a portion of the Ready School Initiative, which includes STEAM and project-based learning, not to exceed 15% of the revenues collected in the Westside EDA or $270,000, whichever is less. So just to piggyback on your um, your information, Jeff. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really, really nice. Um, Commissioner Thomas, any questions or comments? Jones. Oh, Jones. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh my God. No, <laughs> the, what the RDC has been doing, it really is wonderful. Um, TIFs, can be very useful to a community in a lot of ways, but they do kind of sap off some of the money that would go to schools. And by doing this, the RDC, it's nothing that they have to do it, do. They're doing it to help the schools out. And uh, that's something very commendable. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We don't have a lot of control over some of the money that goes to our schools. And so this is a really good effort. Um, <clears throat> are there any public questions or comments here? Seeing, uh, I see that we have something from Mr. Uh, Enright Randolph. Is this about something on the claims? No, just the discussion. Uh, my first act when I was appointed to the plan commission was to extend that TIF. And then uh, it was such a great process to see the county working with uh, Richland Bean Blossom and uh, moving in this direction. It was such a great promise um, uh, of the way that we can help assist them. And I just, I got lost in the conversation and had to make a comment. <laughs> That's good, that's good. As a former math and science teacher, I really appreciate this, especially since it encourages more uh, of our girl students uh, to follow that path. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Cockrell, are we ready for a vote? Uh, Commissioner Githens. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Motion is approved 2-0, so I would say yes, we were ready for it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, I will note that we have a, our monthly report from the treasurer. And at this time, let's move on to item eight, new business, Commissioner Jones. <laughs> Review of addendum A to the Monroe County um, COOP plan entitled Vaccine and Testing Requirement Policy as per OSHA standard. Second. Yes, and the review is that the, and the update is that the Supreme Court last Thursday uh, reinstituted the stay on the enforce of the enforceability of those uh, temporary emergency standards by OSHA. These are the standards that require uh, vaccination or a weekly testing um, of employees. Um, our policy was put in place with with the understanding that those those requirements were going to be met and there were serious uh, financial consequences if, if we did not meet those. And so I thought that since it's no longer enforceable, we probably should have a discussion on whether we wanted to keep uh, those in place right now or if we wanted to wait until it worked its way through the courts. I included in the packet a amendment to that if you chose that would only make those enforceable upon uh, the enforceability of OSHA of those temporary emergency standards. Um, so if you have any questions, I, I think that's kind of a big change from when we enacted that policy. So I think a, a review of that's necessary and advisable. So at this point, we're just kind of putting this on hold. I, I think what, what, what this would do if, if, if you approved the, what was included in the packet, what would happen is that it would suspend the enforcement of um, all those rules. It would keep them in place so that everybody would know, hey, if, if, if things change, um, if our rules change with OSHA, uh, we know what the plan is, but not instituting it right now. Um, I think when we heard earlier today about the availability of testings and things like that, that that's certainly a consideration. I don't think we have a whole lot of, well, I can tell you I went to two CVSs over the weekend and not for looking for tests, but I looked anyway, and there weren't any. There weren't any of the home tests or anything like that. So there is a shortage of that. Um, hopefully that the tests from the, for, from the post office will help alleviate that somewhat, but it's too early to tell. Mr. Jones, any comments or questions on this? I, I take it this means that if the policy is, uh, if the Supreme Court removes the stay in the policy and it goes into effect, we will not have to take another action on it. It'll just automatically. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It sounds good to me. Is there any public comment on this item? I don't have anything. I appreciate the thorough explanation. Um, so at this point, uh, Mr. Carco, would you call the, the roll? I, I think you actually need a motion to approve it. I think that what was introduced was just a review of, oh. of what's oh, going on. I'm sorry. I... No, no, that, that was intentional. Oh, okay. <laughs> the discussion was required in order to, to reach a conclusion, and I think it's important to have that prior to looking at what was drafted. Okay. So, so do we uh, need a, a vote on the, the review and then a second motion on the... I don't think you need a vote on the review because the review is just the conversation we had, um, so there is nothing to approve. It's just we had it, and just like any other discussion item. Okay. Move to approve addendum A to the Monroe County COOP plan entitled Vaccine and Testing Requirement Policy as per OSHA standard. Second. And, and I would just note that this is the amendment that includes the language uh, that changes the effective date of that plan. Uh, now, are there, are there any other comments, Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Any from the public? I'm not seeing anyone. Um, so now, <laughs> Mr. Cockrell, is it appropriate to call the roll? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Commissioner Githens? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. 
Motion is approved two to zero. I didn't see anything else on our agenda for today. Um, I hope I didn't miss something. Um, it feels like we must have, but <laughs> I didn't see anything else. Okay. Um, we don't have any appointments for today. Uh, Commissioner Jones, do you have any announcements? No, I don't. Um, well, I, um, I'm dressed in red today because it's a wear red for ed day uh, in support of our public school teachers all across the state. So I'd like to point that out. Um, they are working to take care of our kids. They work really hard and they've gone through a lot over during the past couple of years during this pandemic. They, they've been amazing in so many ways. So um, we do have blood drives scheduled. Um, the next one is Monday, January, I think it's Monday. It's January 31st from 10 until three. And on February the 2nd from one until six. And both of those are at Ivy Tech, which means really easy parking. Um, easy access, and you can register at redcross.org. Just find the ones from Monroe County. Again, that's January 31st or February 2nd. The blood drives that the county has um, sponsored to date have been absolutely amazing. We're one of the top uh, kind of donor sites across the whole state. Uh, I believe I'd, I'll have to check with uh, Ms. Petroline, but at one point we were I don't know, either first or second in the whole state. Uh, it's just another way that the residents of Monroe County give back. And I'm really, really proud to be part of that, uh, that we have those kinds of people here. Um, we are still accepting applications for all boards and commissions. You can go to co.monroe.in.us uh, to find the application and more information about our different boards and commissions. Uh, and the next meeting of Monroe County Commissioners is January 26, 2022 at 10 a.m. via Zoom. Uh, 